Let's give the Lord a hand. Let's give the Lord a hand. Say, Jesus. I want to say hello to everybody watching online. God bless you. And let's give a shout out to our military who are watching online around the world. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. God bless you. Let's say a word of prayer real quick. Lord, thank you so much for being God. And we thank you that none of us are God. Hmm. Can I get an amen? Thank you that nobody we know is God. We thank you that you've always been God, you are God now, you always will be God, and we pray you bless us today, and we can be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, in nombre de Jesus, amen. Let's see your Bibles today. Let's see your Bibles. Say word. Let's see your pens. Lesson plan, lesson plan. Let's turn to Jonah, 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 chapter 1. Jonah, chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Hopefully y'all are finding Jonah quicker these days. <laughs> when I was about 10 years old or so, a guy up the street, one of my friends, he was a year or two older than me. His name was Rodney. Probably, his name probably still is Rodney. He said, let's go up to the store and get some stuff. It was a grocery store. It was about a mile away. So we walked up to the grocery store, and he had a bag. He pulled out a bag that he had brought with him. And we walked up every aisle, and he told me to put stuff in the bag. And I was a naive little kid. I, I really didn't know what was going on in the back of my mind. I'm thinking, don't we usually put the stuff in the bag after you pay? So we went up in the aisle, he said, put that in the bag, put that in the bag, put that in the bag. And we got to the last aisle, this man came up to us and put his hand on our shoulder and said, come with me. And it was dawned on me when that happened that we were stealing. I didn't know. And my heart went into my throat. Now, my dad's a cop. We got whoopings. How many of y'all got whoopings growing up? Okay. There was no child protective CPS services. At least I, I don't think they came to my neighborhood. And if, if I called the cops, my dad was going to show up. So I was, you know, nothing we can do. So I remember him walking us back like it was yesterday, walking past the meat, past the cold cuts, into the back room where they have the storage. And, we, and they called Rodney's mother. And I just remember I had my back to Rodney at this moment. I heard... And I looked around, and she just smacked him upside his head, in his face, and said, you know, what are you doing, blah, 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 blah. And then she looked at me, and, I, and then if she, would have, if she would have spanked me, it would have been cool, because back then you could spank your neighbor's kids, and, and then, take, then you get spanked by every neighbor walking up the street, and you get to your mother, and you get whooping. But we had to walk all the way home, and she yelled at him and us the whole way home. And I just remember walking. I went to Catholic school, so I knew this was wrong. And I walked all the way home thinking, oh, I'm going to get a whooping. Oh, I'm going to get a whooping. I remember she knocked on the door and told my mother what, what happened. My mother just looked at me, and she says, you better be lucky. I'm not going to tell your father. The only reason I am alive today. <laughs> there comes a time in our life where God calls us to do something right, and we do something wrong. And God, in his own way, reverses our course. And he has something happen that wakes us up. Now, we started the story about Jonah two weeks ago. We talked about how God called Jonah to love Nineveh. And Jonah went the opposite direction. He, got, he went to Joppa, got in a boat, was going to go to Tarshish, hundreds of miles away. And when they were out on the sea, God sent a storm and said, Jonah, you're going to Nineveh. And some of y'all, God has been calling you to do something, whether it be love your city, do ministry, whether it be to pray for somebody, start praying an hour a day. Fellas, we've been talking about praying an hour a day. And we had a bunch of guys up here. We had about 2,000 guys up here uh, Tuesday night. How many of y'all were there? Anybody? Fellas, amen, amen. And so God's been telling you to go pray. He's been telling you to read your Bible. He's been telling you to say sorry to your wife, whatever it is. And you're not doing it. And God is trying to very lovingly nudge you to go do it. He's trying to have, send some experience in your life will wake you up so you can do the right thing. I never stole again. I was scared. I was scared. I said, Lord, I'll never do this again. And I, I wasn't. And so in the story we're going to read, it's about Jonah getting swallowed by a whale. Now, or, or a fish, I should say. And let me say this. 
I, we've, I'm sure you've heard this story. I wonder if you thought, is it really possible? I know people think it's a myth. The guy could spend three days and three nights in a whale and get puked up and, and go live to tell about it. So we're going to look at this story. But I want to look at what Jonah said and what he realized when he was in the fish belly. The title of the sermon is Fish Belly. Because God is going to put you in a fish belly. And you're over here doing your own thing, and he's going to send a fish to swallow you up. And the, the intent is that when you're in the belly, is that you would wake up and say, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve you? That's the bottom line. So let's read chapter 1, Jonah, verse 17. It says, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Let's stop right there. The Lord prepared the fish. Uh, the Lord created the fish. The Lord sent the fish. <laughs> the Lord had the fish go up to the surface or wherever Jonah was and swallow a brother. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We'll talk about that in a minute. We'll get back to that. Look what Jonah happened. Now, as I read this, I want you to think about what you're going through today. And I want you to think about the fact that maybe you need to say this to God. What Jonah's getting ready to say to God is that God will allow or send things into your life, situations to get you to wake up, to say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to stop resisting you. I'm going to stop giving you the Heisman. Because look what it says. Verse 1. Jonah prayed. This is you. Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, to, to the Lord his God from the fish's belly and said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried out, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Uh, it is so pitiful. When God sends us through pain after pain after pain, and we won't tell him we're sorry. We won't admit we're wrong. Jonah's finally admitted, and you know what it took? Him to be swallowed by a fish. You know why sometimes big, big drama comes on us? Because we're hard-headed. Sometimes. God says, you know, you're not going to listen to me unless I swallow you by a fish. And I'm going to give you three days to think about it. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth was its bars behind, closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up, up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. And when my soul fainted with me, everyone say, my soul fainted. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay you what you, I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. This is all God wants is for Jonah to say, God, I will do what you want. That's it. That's it. All God wants you to say is I'll do what you want. And look what it says in verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and the fish vomited, earled, Jonah on dry land. And that's nasty. Anyone say that's nasty? Okay, let's talk about the fish. Let's talk about this. Here's Jonah. Jonah said, God said, go to, go to uh, Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. Or go to TJ, Tijuana, and you go to L.A. And God, as you're going to L.A., you get a flat. As you're going to L.A., you run out of gas. As you're going to L.A., you get robbed. Why? God's saying you ain't supposed to be in L.A. You're supposed to be in Tarshish. And at what point are you going to say, okay, God, my bad? Now, could this have really happened? God can do anything. God spoke, and there were the heavens. God spoke, and there were birds. God spoke, and there were animals. God spoke, and the sun came up. Matter of fact, we had the clock go forward today. God spoke, and he, and he has the, the sun and the earth and all this stuff rotating on clockwork at his word. At his word. 
Now, people say, well, could a man really live in a fish? Well, I give you two ex- ex- scenarios. Jesus himself, in Matthew chapter 24, tw- 12, verse 40, Jesus himself said, For as Jonah was in three days and three nights in the whale's belly or the fish belly or the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of earth. Um, there are a blue whale, sperm whale, great white shark have all have had objects in their stomachs the size of grown men. So there have been found in the bellies of sea monsters people or things, I should say, the size of grown men. But let me give you some perspective. By the way, two scientists from San Diego State, they, their guess, their educated guess is that it was a great white shark that ate Jonah. Uh, but let me give you some stats on some other fish. A sperm whale can grow to 60 feet long. And, and by the way, uh, this building is only 45 feet high. So you're talking about another 15 feet above this roof of this building. So when you go outside, you look at the height of this building, this sperm whale can go 15 feet, 50% higher than this building and long. 40 to 50 tons. And its throat is 20 inches wide. A blue whale has a heart 1,300 pounds, like a little Volkswagen Beetle. Children can crawl through their arteries they are so big. And they found, a matter of fact, blue whales are so loud. It's the loudest animal on the planet. They can be heard 500 miles away underwater. 50 people can stand on the tongue of a blue whale. That's some good kissing right there. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I was just saying, that's, that's a whole lot of tongue. A whole lot of tongue. <laughs> 50 people can stand. Y'all can deal with that later. 50 people can stand on that tongue. <laughs> tongue, tongue weighs over two tons. Um, but they, they found in 1933, they found a blue whale. It was 100 feet long. 100 feet. T- more than twice the height of this building. And it had a mouth that was 10 feet wide. That's the, from the floor to a basketball rim. And, and cavities in its cranial, you know, like its cranial cavities that were seven feet by seven feet and 14 feet long. Now, you can sit, fit in that easy. The point is that this fish today, that you can fit in easy. What God hooked up back then, who knows? And God could have just said, you know what, I'm going to make a fish just for this one thing. He could have done that. He could have done anything he wanted. Remember, when you read the Bible, you have to understand you're talking about God and science. God created science. God created science, but he's not limited by science. We are. He's not. He created it. He can create any fish, any bird he wants any time. The other thing that could have happened, Jonah could have died in the whale. He could have been in the whale dead, which makes a whole lot of sense to me. Why? Because Jesus said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so will I be in the belly of the earth. Jesus was dead in the belly of the earth. He died. He rose from the dead. Jonah could have got swallowed up. Boom, in there, died, woke up, and prayed the prayer. Man, God, you, you brought me out of death, and then got puked up. There's a whole bunch of, matter of fact, there's eight resurrections in the Bible. Elijah raised someone from the dead, a young boy. Elisha raised a young boy from the dead. Paul raised a grown man from the dead. Peter raised someone from the dead. Jesus raised three people from the dead. There's a whole bunch of resurrections in the Bible. That's nothing new. And so for God to raise Jonah from the dead, if Elisha, Elijah, Jesus, Peter, Paul can raise people from the dead, so can God. He raised his son from the dead. No big deal. He did it before. He's going to do it again. And so Jonah could have got swallowed up, dead, died, and God said, wake up, you're getting ready to get puked out. He woke up, said, dear Lord, and he prayed a prayer, and boom, he got puked out. The point is that God can do whatever he wants, and all I need to know is that Jesus affirmed it, the Bible affirms it, it happened. Here's the point. Jesus says it's true. But let's look at our notes because I want to talk about the fish belly. Because each one of us is going to be in a fish belly. Number one, the fish belly is prepared by God. In other words, here's Jonah running from God. He's out on the ocean. The storm comes. They throw him in the ocean. And out of nowhere, this gigantic fish Uh, literally a sea monster comes from nowhere and swallows them up. God can send into your life out of nowhere, anytime, a lesson. (laughs) 
drama, a wake-up call. I don't know if you've ever been driving somewhere and you're just about going to be late and you get a flat. You go, why now? Or you come home and you're rushing and, and your wife or husband drops something on you, why now? God's timing is always perfect. And you may be in some drama right now. God's timing is always perfect. And he will send into your life at the right time, the right situation to get you to do the right thing. The question is, will you step back and realize? When I was coaching Pop Warner football, whenever we were, I was the offensive coordinator, whenever we, would, whenever we were going to decide to go for it on fourth down, I had a rule. I didn't always keep by the rule, but I had a rule that I wrote down. It says, if you're going to go for it on fourth down, call a timeout before you do it. So, you know, first down, we didn't get it. You know, second down, third down, third down, we didn't get the first down. It's fourth down. And if you're going to go on fourth down, unless it's like no-brainer, and, and, and you just call a timeout. Why? Think about it. Just, just let's get our heads together, bring the quarterback in. My son was a quarterback. Okay, let's get the other coaches. Are we going to do this? Because if we don't, we're going to lose the ball. And if God has, if, if you are in the fish belly and stuff is not going right in your life or you're hitting up against the wall before you make a decision, Lord, what do you want me to do? Don't rush. What do you want me to do? Listen to him. Listen to him. Number two, and this is very critical, number two. The fish belly is not intended to imprison you forever. In other words, God doesn't want you in that situation the whole time. God is using that to shape and mold you. God is using that to teach you. Matter of fact, I haven't, I haven't thrown up since I was about five years old. Five, six. I remember it being a horrible, situ horrible experience. How, ain't puking horrible? When you're a little kid, it's like when you're really, really little, like little babies, they throw up like, they'll be talking, hey, oh, hey. <laughs> they just flow. <laughs> it's like the E-Trade baby, he's just talking about stocks, and then he, oh, man, look at that, and he just talks about stocks. like nobody. Adults, you're like, uh, uh, uh. so I remember when I was like five or six, I said, I don't ever want to throw up ever again, and I haven't, I haven't thrown up since then. Ironically enough, two nights ago, I woke up like four in the morning and I thought I was going to throw up. I'm like, God, I don't need no word picture for this sermon. I get it. I remember. I remember. And I actually thought I was going to throw up. I don't know why. I still don't know why. But throwing up is nasty. It's horrible. And so I did some research, research on puking. What's puking? Nausea. <laughs> nausea actually means seasickness. Naus nauseous or nausea is, actually means in Greek sea. So it has to do with seasickness. But what happens when you throw up? It's very simple. Your stomach says, I don't want this stuff in it, and I'm not passing it to the intestines. In other words, it's coming out, but it ain't going down. <laughs> it's going up. And it just re, and matter of fact, if you look it up on Google, one of the definitions you'll see, it says the ejection of food content from your stomach. But what comes up with it is acid. That's where you get the acid taste. It's just bleh. Sorry. <laughs> if you are the puke, You're the puke. In other words, you're doing the wrong thing, and God says, I'm going to swallow you up, I, I, but I don't want to keep you. I want to, <laughs> I got to get rid of you. I want to redirect your life. I want you to start praying like I told you. I want you to start reading your Bible like I told you. I want you to start serving like I told you. So I'm using this circumstance to wake you up. And when your heart gets right, guess what? A lot of times the drama goes away. The drama's not there to live with you. It's there to prepare you. And so once your heart gets right, if you get puked out, it's painful. But then when you get out, you can clean yourself off. I mean, imagine if Jonah walked into Nineveh, because after he got puked out, he went to Nineveh and preached, and all the people got, they repented. Imagine if he had acid and he looked all nasty because he had puke all over him. They're like, brother, we will repent. Just don't come near us. 
Number three in your notes. Let's get this is number three. The fish belly is intended, the fish belly is designed to equip you to serve. In other words, God is allowing you and putting you in this situation so you can do what he wants you to do. That's the bottom line. So you're saying, well, why is, why is life so hard? Why can't life be easy? Life is not intended to be easy. God has not promised you to be happy all the time. He wants to make you holy. I have this theory about why opposites attract. How many of y'all are married here, by the way? How many of y'all are married? How many of y'all are married to an opposite? Okay, just keep your hands up. <laughs> A couple reasons why. One, I think, you know, God took woman from the man, so he gave woman back to the man to, to replace what he took out. But I have my own personal theory, and my opinion means what? Very good. But here's my opinion, and I think this is one good one. I'm going to give it to you anyway. You can take it for what it's worth. My opinion is this. My wife and I are opposite. I'm a guy. She's a woman. I'm tall. She's short. I like to talk. She don't talk. I like people. I like being around a lot of people. She likes to be, you know, by herself, you know, in small groups. I like to travel. She don't like to go anywhere. <laughs> I like excitement. She likes boring. No, I'm only kids. We have, we have these conversations. Are we married to the right people? Are we supposed to be for somebody else? No, no, no. God put us together, and here's why. Here's my theory. The Bible says that if you want to follow Christ, you have to deny yourself, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. God put us in relationships and had us fall in love with people who are opposite of us. So we would have to deny ourselves and serve that person in order to keep that relationship going. A lot of times, divorce and breakup is because somebody was selfish. Sometimes people get divorced because they shouldn't have got married in the first place. But a lot of times, that's selfishness. I want to get married. I want to get married. I want to, wait a minute, cowboy. No, I want to get married now. Let's do it. Okay. And then you'll find out later. But if you're in a relationship, God has not given you that person so they can make you happy and serve you. God gave you that person so you could serve them. And if, you, if your relationship is going to work with your spouse, it's going to work because you serve the relationship. If your relationship is going to work with Jesus, it's because you served. It's not about being served. Christ said, I didn't even come to be served. I came to serve and give my life as a ransom. He gave us the same example. So if you want your relationship to really work out, instead of saying, instead of imposing on the other person what they should do, which, by the way, you should just get out of your head. Don't do that. I talked to a young lady after last service, and she heard this. Uh, and I've known this girl since she was 13. Now she's 41. And she's married. And she says, why didn't someone tell me that? Because I just got married, and it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is, because you're all about you. You're all about you. What's the point is that God's, it is all about Christ, and we don't want to serve. Our natural tendency is to be served and get what we want. And God says life is the complete opposite. And as we keep wanting to do what we want, God keeps trying to get us to do the right thing, and that's where the conflict comes. And a lot of y'all are married to your fish belly because you won't do what God wants. You continue to do what you want. And God says your life is going to be an uphill battle all the way. That's why when you guys see little kids who just want their way and they want their way, you go, that kid's going to have problems. Why? Because you can obviously see people who are all about themselves are going to have problems. But if we simply say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do what you want. And I'm not going to fight you. All of a sudden, stuff opens up. And God blesses us. And God reveals to us what he really wants us to do. And life becomes easier because you have one less thing to fight, which is God. You will have enemies, you will have critics, you will have drama, but if you're not fighting your most formidable person, which is God, it's easier than fighting against God and people. And so in a minute we're going to pray, and your opportunity, your prayer opportunity is to say, Lord, I'm in the fish belly now. I'm fighting against you now, or I'm in a situation I don't like now. I want to surrender. And I want to do what you want me to do with my life. I want to start reading the Bible like I'm supposed to. I want to start praying like I'm supposed to. I want to serve where you want me to serve. I want to do what you want me to do. And I want out of this fish. I don't need to be in it anymore. I'm good. 
So let's all bow our heads and pray and listen very carefully. God loves every single one of you in this room. He knows every single one of you in this room. And he has an incredible plan for your life. He wants to use you and bless you. And he wants you to be a source of blessing to other people. But you've been fighting him for some reason. You've been resisting him for some reason. And you're in the fish. It's time to get out of the fish. And as the Bible says, put your feet on solid ground. The fish puked Jonah on solid ground. So if you're ready to lay your life down at the feet of the Lord, surrender your life to Jesus, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I know you love me, and I know you have a plan for my life. Jesus, I've been resisting you. I haven't been obedient. I'm not going to fight you anymore. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please take over my life, Jesus. Please cleanse my mind and my heart. You are my Lord and my God. Get me out of this fish belly. Thank you, God. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you pray that prayer in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand up. By standing, you are acknowledging your submission to God for whatever reason. By standing up, you are resurrecting like Jesus resurrected, like Jonah had a second chance in his life. So eyes closed, heads bowed. If you pray that prayer, just stand to your feet and acknowledge Christ. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. 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 We see you all over the room. We see you in the balcony as well. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Now in a minute, we're going to ask all of y'all to come down to the altar. If you're in the balcony, all you're going to have to do is turn around and walk up and the ushers will bring you down. And everybody else, we're just going to, in a minute, celebrate that. We're not going to leave yet. So if you're standing up, just come out of your seat and come on down to the altar and let's give them a hand as they come on down.